Bursting from the tomb And looking up we see A king enthroned on high His wounds of love now glorified Rejoice for soon he'll burst the skies He is risen Hallelujah Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Let the whole world sing, Christ is risen. Christ is risen from the dead. Once again, He is risen. risen. He Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Let the whole world sing, Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. From the dead. You may be seated. Or do we take the offering now? Get everybody excited and stood up. For some reason, my cord chart's gigantic. I don't know what's going on. I just want to point out, this is uh, pretty awesome that we have transgender Corinne here. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, Graham Kendrick just opened for me, so I don't know. You're don't both opening makes for me. me. <laughs> That's true. I'm the middle. I'm, I'm the... <laughs> just behave or I'll mess up the words, okay? Oh, okay. I, a little note of preference. I wrote this for my church, but I have a really hard time writing congregational worship songs, so I just get a little too fancy sometimes. <laughs> but, uh, okay. Gather the saints on this day of rest we come in your name gather the saints in every tongue we come in your name and gather the saints in this city today you came and gather the saints in every realm we come in your name and we sing of God's great love and we love Give a sense of touch, give a 
those hearts of love gather the saints on this day of rest we come in your name and gather the saints in every realm we come in your name we sing of God's great love we sing of God's great love. We love because Jesus loved. And we tell of how he bore the cross and how he raised, he raised. And oh, that this city would know. together we love because you love stand with me Stay standing, that'll be more fun. If you don't mind, do you mind? Is that okay? It's like after lunch. If you sit down, it's yeah. over. I just took the side down a little bit. Um. Um, cool, you guys are great, great singers. Um, yeah, so, so here's a song written just a couple years ago. Um, and it, I, I've been on a bit of a challenge, self-imposed challenge to try to write from some different texts, you know? Um, and so this is kind of a communion song. The chorus is um, are the words of the memorial acclamation, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ uh, will come again. And actually, before it, you're supposed to say, uh, now let's proclaim the mystery of faith, you know? So uh, that's essentially what the chorus is. Um, and uh, I, I wrote um, the chorus pieces were inspired uh, walking in an old, actually an old um, monastery chapel up in the mountains of Colorado. 
sat down on this old, like, out of tune piano. I kind of had the chorus, then came and, and uh, met later with uh, Jenny. Do you guys know Jenny? You, you know her music, Revelation Song, and loads of others. And so I kind of had uh, verse melodies and, and a couple of lyric ideas, and, and Jenny just, uh, the rest of it happened. So, anyway, um, yeah. Uh, key of B, um, pretty straightforward, but um, one six four, one six five four for the verse. Yeah, well, whatever. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> Eight six seven five four zero oh, nine, something like that. Okay. But I, okay. Your body was given. One more time. 
Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. This is the mystery of faith that we proclaim. Amen. How cool was that? Uh, the answer is very cool. <laughs> so w one of the reasons I, I uh, wanted to sing first is because I think it's, uh, we musicians are often overly verbose and we uh, will talk about all sorts of things about the writing process and then, you know, well, you've been to that, that coffee house where the guy said, this is about a girl and she was something or other. Just, just sing the song and tell us about the girl, right? <laughs> so I want to make sure we did the singing, right? And, uh, and it also gives us a sense of what each person does and the kind of uh, spirit of their, of their work because it's important to not just uh, talk about what you would like to do but actually hear what you, what you do. So why don't we just go down the row. I'll just pass the microphone as we go and uh, just tell us a little bit about your, your work, the things that really um, inspire you, the things that you are trying to do with your work. We'll get to you know, various questions, struggles, and, and all those kinds of things. But just kind of go ahead and introduce yourself and your work. My name is Glenn Packiam. Um, um, I've been trying to write songs since I was a kid, <laughs> and, the, and the, the early ones were bad. Uh, and many of the times you still write bad ones, right? So uh, you kind of learn along the way, you just keep writing, and then you discover if it works or not, you know? And um, the, the, the season of life that really began writing worship songs was, was when I was leading worship regularly at our, at our local church. I don't get to lead as much now, so the writing has, the approach to writing has changed. So I try to write um, often collaboratively now with other people who are uh, also leading worship and writers. And, and um, I think in, in the early going when I was at our church in, in, in a worship leader role, a lot of the writing came out of worship times. You know, you'd be in a, in a, in a worship set and I don't know if this is, uh, you know, you'd resonate with this at all, but sometimes you're between songs or at the end of a song, you just kind of vamp on a chord progression and you start singing over it, maybe singing things that come to mind, come to your heart, come out of your heart. Maybe you feel like the Lord is kind of doing something in the room and you just sing. And uh, sometimes you, you, you latch on to a little phrase, you know, and then you just, you, you kind of vamp on that and then you think, I'm going to revisit that later. And then sometimes you revisit it and you're like, that was so dumb. Like that was, that was, that was for that moment. It was, uh, it was amazing, but beyond this moment, no. And other times you're like, yeah, that, that's, um, that's meant to be a song. Um, for me, these days, it's, um, I have four children and there's a lot going on in our lives. And so there are very few moments where inspiration just happens. Um, and so it, it usually happens in set aside time. And then there's this little... Um, you know, a, a chance to go back to the notebooks and say, okay, what, what did I, what I have jot, jotted down? So for me, as I mentioned earlier, kind of the place of, of inspiration for me is trying to uh, find things that are maybe missing from our uh, unofficial hymn book, you know what I'm saying, in, in the contemporary worship churches. So um, sometimes that means, and I said this yesterday at the panel, uh, sometimes that means letting theology be um, not just the, the fence, but kind that keeps you in bounds, but letting theology and the tradition of the church be a well, which Lester changed it to a well. I think I think that was much better. Um, letting it be a well that you draw from, and so uh, sometimes that's been looking through some of these these old prayers of the church and saying, look at the, look at that phrase, look at these phrases. How can we do it? And so not necessarily setting it verbatim to music, but trying to do something with it that inspired is inspired by it. Is that kind of the idea? My name's Miranda Dodson, and I am a singer-songwriter, worship leader from Austin, Texas. Um, I am a part of a church called City Life there. My brother-in-law is the pastor, and about six or seven years ago, they needed somebody to lead the music, and I said, I'll just fill in until we find that person, and it's um, been six years, so. Uh, <laughs> but I, I know, I know. I know, it's hard for me to say no, but... Um, it's been very formative for me to be a part of the church. Um, 
I was able to kind of really grow in my understanding of the gospel truth um, and, and understand. Um, and my, my brother-in-law is a writer, so that really helps because he phrases things really well. So I have like notes upon notes upon notes in my, uh, on my phone from sermons where I was like, God, that phrase, it's golden. Where's my phone? And I'm like, you know, typing it. People think I'm texting. And I'm like, no, it's golden. I got it before I forget it. I know. Um, and so that's really, we collaborate quite often on writing, which is really helpful for our local church. Um, but I do, so I, I write for the church, but I also have kind of my own, my, I don't even know what to call it. I'm like, I write for the church and then for everybody. So I don't really, I haven't come up with a good phrase for everybody. But um, what I try to do is just keep, uh, so it, I'll try to make it brief because we like to talk. Um, about ourselves, <laughs> namely. But so I went through a really serious period of doubt in my faith. I was raised in the church. My dad's a pastor. Um, it wasn't like a rebellious doubt. It was just like a looking from the outside in instead of from the inside out of Christianity for the first time. I was about 23 um, and really began to go, man, this, this sounds crazy what we believe. Like, do I really believe that a man was God? Like, you know, first that God created everything, then the man was God, and that he came and he lived a sinless life, um, he loved perfectly, he died, he rose. I mean, there's so many obstacles to this story, <laughs> like, it seems highly improbable. So I just, I had um, real struggles and real doubts, and just the process of music actually was a re great process in my life for that. Just every Sunday, because I was volunteering at the church, they needed it. Um, I didn't fully doubt it, but I didn't fully believe it. I was sort of figuring it out, and I would be rehearsing the songs with uh, my buddies, and I would just be struggling, like, God, just, I don't know if I can lead this. Like, I don't know if I can lead this truthfully. And we'd go back in the green room, and it's a church plant, so you, it's, there's freedom to be like, I'm struggling here. You know, you're not in this organization that would be like, you're, you're out at, you're like, no, you are not allowed to lead worship if you are struggling with this. So luckily they, I was in that context and they prayed for me and every single time I got up to, to lead the church, I believed it. And I mean, matter of minutes, like 30 minutes. And I'm like, the Holy Spirit began to really utilize that and, and prove himself to me as if he, he needed to do that. But, but Prove himself as faithful and trustworthy. So that is an important piece of the puzzle in my songwriting journey because I began going, I don't want to lead for the church. I don't want to write for the church. I'd done this my whole life. That was kind of my whole context. And, and I felt like church, generally church music is just a totally different context in that I wasn't writing to my full potential and I wanted to do that. So we moved to Austin, Texas, Music City, and uh, I just began to study songwriting and listened like, okay, Bob Dylan sounds horrible, but everyone says he's a great songwriter. So I'm going to try to figure out the mystery that is Bob Dylan because <laughs> I'm super confused. Um, I saw him live actually at Austin City Limits Festival and I was still just like, no idea. There's no idea about what's going on. So I just studied and I worked and I worked with other songwriters and I learned how to edit and craft and edit, 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 and edit some more and until it feels right. And, and learning, I think, how to, learning, the biggest mystery to me was knowing when it wasn't right. Because, you know, you're inspired and you're all, heart's all in it, and so you think everything's golden, you know? So learning when it isn't right and, and, and figure, and I think that's just going through it. So I have my, my stuff for the, for the work, for everybody. Sorry, I'm talking way too much. I'm sorry. Um, for everybody. And then through the process of that with, uh, the Holy Spirit, like emboldening my faith and reassuring my faith and assuring me, I, I wanted to write songs for the church, and that really changed. And so I have both, both kind of avenues. Um, but the stuff that I write for everybody definitely has uh, one of my main goals is to keep my theological framework. Um, that's really important to me, and to write songs that I can stand behind and believe in. So that makes it a little bit difficult when you co-write with people who aren't Christians, because you're like, I know this is crazy, and you're going to hate me, but like, we can't put that line in there if I'm going to co-write with you because of X, Y, and Z, which is a great missional opportunity to explain my faith and ex explain what's going on. So um, anyways, cool. that's my cool. thing. Mm. Very good. That's really interesting. Great to hear the story. No, it's, it's, it's good. Um, I've lived a lot longer, so my story is going to be really long. 
<laughs> okay. Well, um, yeah, background always is important. So um, my father was a Baptist pastor. Another pastor's kid. Baptist. Oh, yeah, Baptist too. Oh, my goodness. Wow, we survived. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And so I uh, grew up in the 60s, so, um, you know, the, my influence is the, essentially the Beatles and the Baptist hymn book. It put those two together, and it explains a lot. Yeah, yeah. It really does. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, a great love for, for the hymn, hymnody, um, but also in my ears, my musical brain wired to that kind of 60s music. Um, picked up a guitar when I was in my teens. I had a bad experience with piano lessons, um, and that made me sort of say, "I don't want to. I don't want any teachers. I don't want any. I don't want any theory. I just want to make some sounds out of this guitar." So, yeah, yeah. so that's what I did. Taught myself to play, and that was always how it was with the guitar. It was kind of, "What can I make this thing do?" You know. Um, uh, started writing some songs, uh, which. Um, itself was like miraculous, you know, um, to me. <laughs> they didn't sound miraculous, but the, the, <laughs> to me, the idea that I could actually write a song was actually one of those powerful moments uh, that I decided this is what I want to do. Perhaps it was because suddenly people uh, kind of noticed me because I could do something. I was a little, little skinny guy. Sh I was no good at sport, quite shy. And, uh, you know, here was something that I could do, um, uh, which people seemed to affirm, you know. Anyway, um, the model I followed at that time was the contemporary Christian music thing, which was coming in uh, from uh, a lot of it from the West Coast America, uh, kind of hi the kind of hippie sort of thing, you know, the, um, the Jesus movement. Um, and they started having these bands come up and, and people like Larry Norman and stuff. And so, so I, when I left college, I trained to be a school teacher. Um, so uh, by that time, I was writing songs in a kind of folky context, kind of Simon and Garfunkel, um, not particularly Bob Dylan, actually. Uh, <laughs> um, but college folk club, that kind of thing, you know. So I thought I would take a gap year. And I'm still in the gap year. Uh, <laughs> but for, for years, it was um, trying to communicate my faith to my contemporaries who weren't interested. Uh, so I kind of gravitated towards telling stories. So um, I loved the Bible. I'd been brought up in the Bible. So I would uh, maybe make up a song about Simon Peter down by the sea. And, and uh, Jesus would come along and, and uh, say, follow me. And so you could sing a story, and people wouldn't know that it was the Bible until the punchline, uh, by which time it was too late. Uh, um, no, it, it, I mean, it, no, it, was just, it, it wasn't um, a polemic kind of, um, you know, just trying to hook people in. It was genuine. I was genuinely expressing my faith, telling the story, and in the course of it, um, you would earn your right to say what you believed, you know. So I'd spend a lot of time in colleges or schools, um, work with teams. We'd visit schools and play a couple of songs in a lesson and then talk about our faith and uh, answer questions and all that sort of thing for years and years. So it was many years before I wrote any praise and worship songs. Uh, so if you like, I was kind of having a, a career in this contemporary Christian music thing, but actually it was really more about evangelistic ministry and working with churches and, uh, and stuff. But at the same time that was all going on, um, there was a kind of a new thing happening in the church, kind of a renewal movements popping up, and I got caught influenced by that and, and, and caught up in it um, and uh, had these experiences of being filled with the Spirit, and of course it made me want to sing and worship in a way that I hadn't before. Um, and it became a kind of wellspring of a different kind of song. And I, used to, I learned to worship in a different way, um, in a kind of waiting on God kind of way, you know. Um, and so I started writing a few songs, mainly for the little team I work with. We're in a traveling team. Stop me if I'm going on too long. Um, I'm little <laughs> So we... We had a yeah. We so we went in this little. Uh, we were in this little traveling team of about ten or a dozen of us doing these church-based missions, and you know someone would be, would be going through some issue, and I'd kind of write a song for them. You know, 
kind of, this is what God put on my heart for you, song. Uh, and then I remember one occasion, um, we were really struggling with our relationships. A lot of strong personalities in this team, people were falling out with each other, and lots of heavy atmospheres and stuff. And we weren't very good at how you sort that stuff out. And I remember writing a, a song, which is a prayer, uh, which went, uh, which the words were, Jesus, stand among us at the meeting of our lives. Be our sweet agreement at the meeting of our eyes. Or Jesus, we love you, so we gather here. Join our hearts in unity and take away our fear. And I, I taught this song to our little team, and it really helped us um, because it helped us all to pray, oh, God, please help us to love each other, <laughs> you know, and deal with these fears inside which make us so insecure and, and, and stuff. But that song started to get on the grapevine along with a few others that I wrote. And in those days... Uh, the latest technology was the overhead projector, you know, right on a piece of clear acetate, slap it on, on the thing, and, and immediately you have an instant songbook you know, on the screen if you can read the scrawly writing. Um, but because of that innovation, because up to that point, you know, you got a new hymn book every 25 years, um, and, um, you know, maybe somebody Xeroxed off, off a, a, a few choruses and illegally... And, Prints them out for the church, uh, but all of a sudden you could you could have a meeting. You could say, "I've got a new song." Pop it up there, and then you sing it. And if it worked, people would say, "Oh, that was a great song." I wrote down the words while you were singing it, and and guess some of the chords. Can you tell me what that chord was? And so songs would travel. This is back in the sort of mid to late seventies. Songs began to travel around the world, um, you know, by word of mouth. And there was, there was no question of, I mean, in a sense, it was an in, an age of innocence because the idea of actually making any money wrought it out of this thing was kind of, just didn't happen. You know, nobody was collecting. Um, uh, and so there was a lovely innocence about it and a lovely grassroots kind of naturalness about these songs flowing out of movements of God and people and, ch and new, imagining church in a, in, a, in a new way. So then I... I'll finish with this. I suddenly found myself in a position where there was, my generation was suddenly having their own events. And a friend of mine uh, and a friend of his initiated a, a, a kind of youth event. We had about 3,500 people came along for about a week. Um, and um, we weren't sure what it was. Was this a kind of Christian pop festival or is it a, a kind of Christian training seminar? We had lots of artists singing songs. And halfway through, people started getting really tired of just getting performed at. And uh, I remember my friend Clive uh, coming to me and say, the people really need to sing, Graham, get out there and lead some songs. And I was thinking, no, I'm an artist, I'm a performer, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't do that sort of, sort of stuff. I kind of, you know, I did look down on it somewhat as a lesser thing than me getting out there and performing my moving, intense, lyrically profound. <laughs> songs you know um, anyway no I knew about being a servant serving one another so I said okay I'll do it and that kind of uh, was a beginning because people were just hungry for songs and I was in a position where I could both write songs and also a platform to share the songs uh, and so kind of into the 80s bang 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 song after song just started taking off and there were very few of us writing at those times, so we, we had a great time. <laughs> Everybody was singing our songs in the UK because they were the only ones around. <laughs> so here we go. I've said it. Good job. No, that's, that's really interesting to hear. Now, uh, I won't, I'm the moderator, so I'm not going to tell my story, but I will say this. Uh, there's always been this sense of, so I, I grew up as a musician, but that was my primary thing, and I am probably in between you guys and, and Graham, so I was still on the, at the point where if you're a musician, and you'd say, you know, they'd say, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a composer, and they'd say, so you want to write songs to bring people to the Lord? And uh, so it, in our time, it was evangelistic. You know, that, like if you're going to be a musician, you had to, you had to just, okay, well, you know, then we would do altar calls at the end. That would be, it was like bait. It was really what your, your life was about. And then I'm going to guess when you guys were getting into it, it's like, so you say, I want to be a musician. And they say, so you want to lead worship, right? So there's a switch in maybe the mid-80s or 90s or something to that effect. But for me, growing up as a musician, 
I always hated the idea of doing church music, yeah. all right, because I just thought that basically if, if all else failed, then you'd fall back on church music, just if you had to. <laughs> um, so I guess here, here's, I do this as a lead in to say this, and, and we'll get to this part of, of your uh, talk. We'll start with Miranda, because she, she is currently, you've got these two sides of you, the singer-songwriter and the, the worship musician. And, and so this is, what I'm trying to tease out is this, as songwriters, your background is in music. You know, you're listening to Bob Dylan uh, and you know, trying to figure out how does he write a great song. Well, how do you make that jump from being a musician, a singer-songwriter, a songwriter, a performer, all of those kinds of things that are part of the world of music? Mm. How do you make that transition now to being a worship writer? So I'm going to start with Miranda because she's in the thick of it. Then we'll go to Glenn to hear a little bit of that part of his story. And mm -hmm. Thank you, Glenn. Sure. Um, One second. How long do we have? We have till 2.15. 2.15. Okay, we don't have much oh, wow. time. All right, just talk super fast. Okay. We've got 13 minutes. All right, go. Well, I have less than that because Glenn likes to talk too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we've sat on a couple of panels. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Um, it is hard. I don't know that. So I, I kind of started out in the Christian world and wrote really, uh, you know, that was my influence. I mean, my parents are both musicians, but they aren't very well listened <laughs> or whatever. Did you worship song first? It did. Yeah. My dad was a youth minister. And so I taught myself how to play the guitar um, to be in the worship band and uh, immediately started writing songs. It just like, as soon as I could put three chords together was writing. So that was my primary influence. So that's where I came from was this sort of congregational, um, you know, more, not, sim not simple, but in some ways like where everyone can, everyone can catch on. Um, and then I just, you know, w went into this other direction of like, okay, how can I, become more artistic about it and more thoughtful about it. And, um, and so now I'm sort of on the other end trying to get correct the ship a little bit and learn how to, again, because um, what we're trying to do is create songs that are a new song to the Lord. Um, and we're trying to make it to where the cool thing about being human is that everybody can sing. I mean, God, God with his own hands made, made us and his, our vocal cords are the only instrument that God directly made, which is awesome. Um, so every one of us, it's, it's, the door is wide open. Whether you sing well or not, that's you know, a different story. But everyone can sing, which is awesome. So it's a, it's, it is a unifying thing for the church to sing together um, in a way that, that, like Graham's story said, it, it crosses quarrels and, and crosses, you know, ethnic boundaries and generational boundaries. It's an amazing tool. So what we're trying to do is, is take the, take these, uh, you know, and all hymns kind of set up the, the form of this where it's kind of the same thing. It's repetitive. So everyone can, you know, you start a hymn and by the end of it, you're a pro, you can like sing it in your sleep. Um, we're trying to kind of take that sentiment, but like, modernize it in a way and you know I love what you did take these deeper theological truths with um, mystery of faith and make them accessible for us like in, in the same way that you know you know back in the day in Catholicism when only the priest could read the Bible you know and and so, you know they took it and made it accessible for us in that same way we want to unify the church in that so I'm learning how to do that I'm not very good at it but I'm getting better, and one of the things I do, I mean, it's great to try it out in my church, and like, I've tried out a few songs and, that are great for more per personal devotion that just are hard to sing, and so we don't sing them congregationally. I'm not going to force feed my church uh, just because I think it's theologically you know, correct or that it's helpful. Um, some songs are for devotion, and some songs are for the congregation, and I think sometimes I just have to you know, take in criticism, ask people, and, uh, and, you know, try to be open-handed with it and edit appropriately and maybe take some things out that I would love to keep in right. to serve the church because really we are servants of the church. Right. Is that, how, is that yeah, what you're asking? Great. So, Glenn, tell us a little bit. Did you start as a pop musician? Or <laughs> no. <laughs> it was a boy band. Right, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> That would be funny. The thing, the thing about my, my story that's different than um, Miranda's and Graham's is I wasn't that great of a musician, you know, so I could never have been the artist uh, thing because, well, for a, a number of reasons, but for me, so you alluded to what era, right? So 
when when Christian music was kind of becoming, uh, when I was a teenager, it was like Michael W. Smith, Stephen Curtis Chapman, you know, BB and CC Winans, and then on the worship side, it was like Hosanna Integrity. So I, that was my thing. It was Ron Canole. It was it was Don Moen. It was that sort of thing. And then later on, guys like Kent Henry, and you know, into the more spontaneous uh, kind of stuff. So, but I always gravitated toward worship music because um, it's simpler. <laughs> And, and for me, like I wasn't, a, I, I was, I kind of began piano lessons in the classical kind of vein and then stopped after a few years because I wasn't, didn't have the, the discipline to kind of get all these chops down. And then later, similar to you, Graham, started teaching myself guitar just to have something to play. Well, the, the range of chords <laughs> and, and all that sort of thing, it just appealed to me. It was like, this is, this is very simple. And I, I think, you know, as you get better at your instrument or whatever, I think for me, um, performing music was fun in that you get to sing and you, you get to move people, but it always felt like a ton of pressure. Uh, as much, I felt much more comfortable with starting out the song and hearing people join in and sing and sing, okay, whew, they're singing, you know, uh, and they're not all staring at me and all. So there's probably some personality slash skill level kind of stuff associated with it for me. But what you learn over the years is what is it that makes the, the, the distinction between congregational music and, like you said, even devotional or listening. I mean, a big part of it is accessibility you know, is how, how um, easily can people sing this? And I was just sitting with Lester Ruth this morning. He's a researcher at Duke and all that. You know Lester. But he talked about how just charting over the last um, 30 years of Christian music, how simple the form was to how complex it is now. So it used to just be a verse or just be a chorus and then maybe a bridge and all this stuff, right? And then now it's like not only a verse but two verses and not only a chorus but also a bridge and then not only a bridge but maybe an alternate tag outro, you know, that you vamp and fist bump on, you know. It's not, it's a, there's just kind of, there's, and then add on an, a whoa section, you know, just for good measure. So there's always, there's always because Lord knows the other parts of the song were too complicated but once we get to the whoa we can all chant together, you know. So, so there is this line between accessibility and creativity, and I, I think as a worship songwriter, you're always trying to, to find that line. When, uh, when I co-wrote the song with Paul Balas, uh, Your Name, he kind of had the verse melody, and it's so boringly simple that I got up from there thinking, Paul, this is, this is just not even interesting. As morning dawns and evening, ooh, there's another note, fades. <laughs> you inspire songs of praise. Oh, you know, who's going to sing that? It turns out lots of people can, you know? <laughs> And, and I remember hearing someone joke about Tim Hughes' song, Here I Am to Worship. That song, I believe, is a five-note range. That's why you can sing Here I Am to Worship in like six different keys. Yeah. Always apply. Always apply. You know, so anyway, I do think we're in a place now where perhaps the ability of congregations to sing and sing more complex music uh, has, has, um, has uh, been stretched more. But I also wonder um, if, Graham, you were saying that advantage that you had was there were not many writers and not many songs. Now there's such a proliferation of music. When I stand up to, to just pick up my guitar and lead a few friends in a song, I don't even know what song they all, that we all know. Because you have someone who says, well, I don't know. I, I've been listening to the new Bethel. Or I've been listening to the Hill song. Or I've been listening to Passion. Or I've been, I, I really don't know how many songs does, are there that everybody knows, you know. So that's a, those are some of the challenges we're navigating as writers. And you have to kind of, we always decided with, with our guys at New Life that it was impossible to write for the masses because you just, that's a moving target. You just don't know who that is. So the best that you could do is write for your church and for the people that you had in mind. And then when you tried it out on Sundays and if people sang along, you thought, okay, we've hit the mark. We've got, we've got limited time. I'd like to get some questions from you guys. So I'm going to ask Graham, since he's, you've kind of had this flyover view of, of this history from the very, you know, the, the scripture song kinds of things. Um, and then you've worked with lots of modern people and have seen how the industry has grown. So could you kind of... I don't know exactly what question I'm asking, but the kinds of struggles that they're talking about, going from a couple people in the UK that are writing to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Could you just you know, talk to that and see, uh, yeah. summarize the history of Christian worship? 
Well, I think it's a double-edged sword, isn't it? That it's fantastic there is so much creativity um, and so many movements have their own creativity. Um, but it is a problem, someone once said, once upon a time we had a, uh, in a hymn book, in the hymn book days we had 250 songs that everyone knew. Now we have 250,000 songs that nobody knows. <laughs> And it is an issue. So I think the only answer to it is it's a local thing. I mean, what's happening is happening. People are going to be writing. They're going to carry on writing. It's, it all has to find its own level. You can't say it should, this is going to happen or that's going to happen. It's, it's happening. But I think if you're a, a local worship leader or part of a, a team leading a church, you are gatekeepers of, of what happens in your church. And that is the point at which you can actually make a difference rather than saying, oh, it's all too much or, uh, or whatever. Uh, out of these, you know, the values that you hold together as a team as to, you know, what is this about? What is the point of our, our singing? You know, um, what, what are we trying to teach? Is formation or the stuff that Glenn was speaking about in the workshop I just listened to. It's really good stuff. Get the recording if it was recorded. Um, according to those principles and values that you share in your local situation, you have to then make choices, and probably those choices are going to be, right, we're going to have to narrow down to this, this is our repertoire for this season, and we bump off a couple of old songs, we introduce a couple of new songs, but we don't have three new songs every week, um, and we, we, we make sure people, because people, do you know, I, one of the things I've noticed in recent years is that people have stopped singing, they've become spectators, and it's no good us on the platform complaining that they're spectators if we behave like performers, you know, like entertainers. Uh, it's our responsibility to create a, a, what I call a culture of participation. So people know that the culture in this church is that you join in if you can. No, no pressure, but that's, you know, that's, that's, our, that's our value. And once you've done that, you then have got to make sure if you have a new song, you teach it properly. You know, now people don't come every week to a church. So, you know, how long does it take to, for a song to bed in? It might take a few months before all your regular people, including the people who only come once a month, have actually had a chance to use the song. So it really slows things down. And for worship leaders who are always into the new thing, it can be, it, you know, it can be a bit chafing. But I think we have to then come under the, the values um, of, uh, you know, spiritual formation and so on through. Uh, through the songs that we, we sing and the theological um, weight of those songs and integrity, uh, all those things that really mattered. Yeah. But we are, it's the local level on which I think the choices finally are made. No one's forcing you to sing the latest popular worship song. Well, let's hope they're not. You know, I know there's pressure from people to say, oh, can we do such and such? But you have to live above that. All right, so I hope someone tweeted. We used to have a hymnal with 250 songs we all knew, and now we have 250,000 songs that no one knows. Someone, is someone tweeting that? Someone else. All right. So tweet it. Stolen from Grand Kendrick. All right. So we've got just uh, one minute. So we can take at least one question. I want to get you to your next thing and make sure you have coffee. Does somebody have any questions for any of the songwriters? Uh, oh, back there. Yes. So, so each of you would say something different. You just kind of have to find your groove. I think. I think for me, and I'll go quickly. I'm sure we could all uh, talk about this for two hours. Um, but I think for me, it's usually a thought or like a phrase that I start with. Like if if someone said something, or if I read something, or even if I just like I wrote a song called Home about homelessness because in Austin there's quite a few homeless and I just kept thinking about like they live out there they're people made in the image of God and they're just they're walking and I drive by them every day and they're walking out there to live um, and and it just made me think about how we're all dysfunctional and so in it that idea just kept lingering in my head and usually that's the Holy Spirit I've learned you know prompting a song and so that usually starts it but um, and then I just I kind of usually jot down ideas around you know like phrases or things that just come to mind around that idea and then kind of start 
with the melody. And um, I usually start at the beginning of the song. I don't, I'm not really good at choruses. I'm awesome at first verses. <laughs> that's usually my problem. Um, so I usually will just start. I'm linear. That's the way I think. I know other people don't work that way, but that's, that's usually how it goes for me. Um, I think however it goes, there's almost always two parts to the process, wouldn't you say? There's an inspiration moment, and then there's an, a crafting, a, a analytical moment. And, and then, and then yeah, the, the, so, so the, I think the trick is always you want to get all the, all, the, all the magic out of the inspiration phase before you start analyzing and crafting and editing, you know what I mean? Like you can kill a, uh, the inspiration by going to the analytical too quickly, Conversely, you could never go to the analytical editing crafting phase and th and try to ride the inspiration. And all of a sudden, you realize that wasn't that, that good. It wasn't as good as it could have been. Yeah. I will say this, too. Don't... Uh Sometimes it gets you get to the point where it's like I've worked this song and worked this song and worked this song and it still isn't working. Should I just like give up and move on? Um, sometimes yes. Sometimes you should just scrap the whole thing. But if there's something in you that just something about it, like there's just something in that song that is yes, keep working it. Uh, it'll it'll eventually pay off. So the Apostles Creed song, the whole reason that. Calvin asked me to come here. It took me three and a half, four years to write. And I didn't even have to write the words, people. Like, <laughs> I just had to write the music. <laughs> so it's, it's an, it, I, it was something I couldn't let go of in there. I, was, I started on the guitar, and I started working with it. And then I, I got to a point, I just kept putting it down, but kept picking it back up. And finally, I moved it to the piano. And it was like changing instruments is a, is a great tool of the trade change instruments, sometimes it brings things to life that were dead long ago, change instruments, and then here's my other little tip for you to run with that took me a while to figure out, flip the, flip the lines. Yep. So sometimes you're thinking literally, so you're thinking linearly, so you're thinking, oh, this, this, and this, that, that, and that, when, and it's kind of obvious, it's too obvious. And so it gets a little boring and people just, eh, nah, nah. but what you do is you flip the lines and then all of a sudden it's, you're still saying the exact same thing. It still rhymes, but you're saying it in a, in just enough of a different way that catches people's attention that goes, hmm, that was said differently. And, and then they're, then you've got them. So those are my two little tips I wanted to nice. yeah, good. leave you with. Have, have any of you worked with, I think it's Pat Patterson, songwriting lyric, the lyric. Yeah, so uh, Pat Patterson is a, teaches at Berkeley School of Music. I found that book was a good book. And, and in, if, if you're writing kind of, if you have trouble writing lyrics and you're coming out with kind of lackluster lyrics, uh, he has a lot of good ideas. Yeah, it's more geared towards singer-songwriters, uh, country, you know, Nashville kind of orientation, but I think it's good in general. I probably have to get you out of here. Uh, so you're free to come up and talk to people, uh, but I need to officially dismiss you right now. Let's hear it for our songwriters.